far, and any we will run the next two days will be posted on Nikon Live. We've got many more programs to come, different genres of photography. And so you can go back and watch them as many times as you would like uh, for a certain period of time. The next uh, photographer I'm going to bring up is somebody that I really uh, respect and admire. And most of what she does on a daily basis, I wouldn't even consider doing because it's dangerous, it's challenging, it's the toughest conditions that you could possibly shoot in that require all kinds of preparation and handling of gear. Um, she has been beaten up by some of the tools that she works with recently, um, but she makes incredible action images in the water with yachting and boat racing. Let me introduce the Nikon Theater stage, Jen Edney. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Wow, it's pretty crazy to be up here. So many people that I'm sharing the stage with have impacted my work so much and my growth and my journey coming here today. So I'm going to start out with a story for you. So the day was finally here. I had dreamed of this for six years. I'm embedded as an onboard reporter for the 2017-2018 Volvo Ocean Race. This around-the-world race takes place just once every three years, and it's considered one of the longest and toughest professional sporting events in the world. Leg one was about to begin, and we were going to be sailing from Alicante, Spain, 1,450 nautical miles to Lisbon, Portugal. Picture a wild setting with hundreds of spectator boats and seven offshore racing yachts, all waiting for the start gun. I was on board a boat called Turn the Tide on Plastic. I was standing next to the skipper near the helm. <sighs> this is such a crazy moment. The start gun sounded, and we were off like lightning, sailing at about 15 knots. We'd rounded all but one of the inshore buoys, and we were racing towards the last one before we left the spectators and went before we left the spectators behind and headed for open water. Everyone was pumped. You could feel the energy in the crew. I was taking stills, but I could tell something was wrong. The energy shifted and everybody started yelling. I quickly switched to video to record what was happening, and suddenly the spectator boats had squeezed our channel and it seemed like there was no place to go. Time froze still as we threaded the needle between our spectator boats and the competitor. We passed close enough to a spectator boat that I could have grabbed the phone out of their hand. I think at one point, our skipper was trying to decide which boat would be better to hit. The race was nearly over before it began. If you listen closely, you can hear me squeal. Take a peek. What a way to start a nine-month journey around the world. Chasing dreams, chasing dreams means, sorry, chasing dreams means you have to make some very difficult decisions. It means take, taking risks. It means living outside your comfort zone. It means doing tough things that make you grow. There is no guidebook. Nobody telling you what to do next. Nobody but you. I was one of 10 onboard reporters for the Volvo Ocean Race. Each boat had a designated onboard reporter, which meant we were on the board, boat 24-7, living, sleeping, working, documenting the sailors' lives around the world. This was a nine-month race, so you can imagine there are many stories to be told. I'm going to share one crazy moment with you. Here we are in the Southern Ocean, sailing from Cape Town, South Africa, to Melbourne on one of the toughest legs of the race. In conditions like these, you're always clipped in when you're on deck. 
While the sailors are trying to keep the boat on track, we are trying to document the story, and everyone is trying to hold on. The thing about working in these conditions is that you can't always hold on, and things can go south in an instant. One day, I was down below helping the crew change some food, food out for the day, and I was holding the food bag up. I was sitting and I was holding the food bag so one of the crew could cut it open. When we went bow down into a wave, and everyone flew forward, and I went head first into the bulkhead. My face tells the weather now. <laughs> the conditions were so rough that day that we couldn't put stitches in, and I had to ask the skipper. We had to ask the skipper to slow down just so we could get the glue in the right spot on my head. And this was Christmas Day a year ago. So how did I get here? I graduated with, a, or I went to college to study business. Or, sorry, I went, I went to college to study medicine first. That wasn't a good fit for me. And then I switched to business, and that didn't work either. So I eventually settled in graphic design and visual journalism. When I graduated, I wasn't quite sure what to do with it, so I gave myself the gift of a trip and some time. Rather than backpacking through Europe, I decided to conquer my fear of the ocean and enrolled myself in a 60-day outward bound course, which was based all on the ocean. 30 days was tall ship sailing, and 30 days was sea kayaking, camping, climbing, wilderness first aid, surfing, and a little bit of service work. I conquered my fear of the ocean, but something much bigger happened. I met my muse. Photography. Our sailing vessel was a 150-foot tall ship called the Spirit of Massachusetts, and our route took us from Puerto Rico to Trinidad. Trinidad was our halfway point, which is where you see the boat now. And this was the, the point where we were able to get off the boat for a few days and stretch our legs. This moment, I just remember, it, it was the most incredible moment for me in this trip because a few of the crew members got off, and they decided to go to the local soccer field to stretch their legs. And I remember I took my camera out, and I just started photographing. And as I started photographing, the local kids came out, and they started playing. And then they came over to see what I was doing. And they were so fascinated by looking at the back of my camera to see their photo. I don't think they had ever seen a digital camera before, or photos of themselves in real time. And it was just one of those moments where Time stood still. I was completely entranced in the moment, and it was something I just didn't want to forget. I lost all the images from that day, but I'll never forget the feeling I felt that day. So I went back to the boat. Everybody was settling in for the night, and I remember sitting there. I can still hear the coquee frogs chirping and the sound of my captain strumming her guitar coming through the window below me. And I just remember that feeling. I remember this, this is what I want to feel every day. I had never felt so content and so alive in a moment. The moment was so powerful, I decided I wanted to memorialize it. So I got a tattoo on my wrist. It says, live, because that's the day that I dove into my life. I knew I needed some more photography training, so I signed myself up for classes at Brooks Institute in Ventura, California. I also while I was taking classes, I also decided to do an internship at the Ventura County Star. One of my assignments with the Ventura County Star was to photograph 16-year-old Zach Sunderland. Zach was a local kid who was preparing his boat to be the youngest kid or youngest person to solo circumnavigate the world. The next week at Brooks, my assignment was to pitch an in-depth photo story to cover for the next six to eight weeks of classes. I pitched this story. For the next few weeks, I, I, or for, I guess for the next few months, I ended up meeting the documentary crew that was going to be following Zach around the world. They mentioned they might need a still photographer to go with them and asked if I was interested and if I had a portfolio. I said yes to both, but I didn't have a portfolio, and I was still in classes. A professional photographer named Eric Thayer had recently presented to our group at Brooks, 
and he'd given us his contact information. So I decided to contact him and see if he could help me put together a portfolio. He did. We met at Starbucks that afternoon. We put together a portfolio, and I got the job. At the time, I was trying to juggle too much. I was doing this project and trying to, trying to do classes. And some of my professors, one in particular, gave me a pretty harsh critique about my work. I remember him saying, my 13-year-old daughter could have shot that. Ouch. <laughs> he recommended that I would draw from classes and follow the story because it was such a big story. I remember him telling me, I don't care how much in debt you go into the story, this is it, and you need to wow me. He scared the crap out of me. So Zach's next stop was the Marshall Islands. And the rules for the record were that we couldn't be on board with him while he was sailing. So we could only be with him on shore. And sometimes he would do some day sails so we could go sailing with him. I had to find various ways to mount cameras on the boats and get different angles. And this was before GoPros existed. I also don't think Nikon knew why I was renting the cameras. Along Zach's journey, there were many stops, and some were more challenging than others. Darwin, Australia was one of those. I had arrived about a week before Zach, and due to bad weather, due to, I think, strong currents and low wind, he was, um, he was delayed coming in. The way things were lining up, I would only have a few days to photograph him. I had enrolled in the Summit Adventure Photography Workshop in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and my flight was about to leave in a couple days. I knew I needed to document this part of the story, but I also, my instinct was telling me I needed to go to this workshop. I was in danger of not getting any images while Zach was in Australia. So as a last resort, I hired a small plane to fly over him when he was close enough. Due to the size of the fuel tank and the location of where Zach was, we would only have three passes around him to get the photo. Adding to the pressure, I had never shot from a plane before. I was pretty scared. I went for it, and I got the shot. I call this my $1,100 shot. <laughs> I made it to the workshop. And the training that I received here gave me the confidence to withdraw from classes and follow Zach's journey for the rest of his trip around the world. The summit became my main source of education, my community, my peer group, and has shaped me into the photographer I am today. The one thing that has been reinforced over and over in my, in my career um, and in my life is relationships. Everybody that you meet has a purpose, and there are no chance encounters. For example, in Cape Town, which is Zach's midway point throughout his journey around the world, I met a guy named Greg Peterson. Greg was a sailing instructor and a delivery skipper, and he was preparing his boat to, to travel to Florida, uh, which would take about six to eight weeks. Zach was preparing to sail to Grenada. He had one little stop before heading there, and that would also take six to eight weeks. My plan was to go to his next stop and then go home and then fly to Grenada to meet him in six to eight weeks. So Zach, the only, place that, the only island or place that you can provision your boat when you're sailing from South Africa across the Atlantic is this little tiny island called St. Helena. It's off, just off the west coast of South Africa. It's where Napoleon was banished to. Um, so this is where Zach was going, and that's where I had to go. I took a ship to get there. I arrived a few days before Zach, and as I was walking up the street, keep in mind, this is the most remote place I've ever been in my life. At this point, you can only get there by boat. So I'm walking up the street, and I see a familiar face. I do a double take, and it's Greg Peterson, the guy I had just met in Cape Town. Greg had also stopped there for provisions. He invited me for a beer. He had two crew members he was sailing with, and one of them wanted to quit. He was done with the trip, and they still had a good six to eight weeks to go. So I think half kiddingly, what are you up to for the next six to eight weeks? I thought about it, and I didn't need to be in Grenada until six to eight weeks, and um, mulled it over. 
Something had happened to me while I was in Cape Town, and I wasn't ready to go home yet. So Greg invited me along for the trip with the other crew member, Jamie. He said, I can't pay you, but it won't cost you anything, and you can learn how to sail along the way. <laughs> Keep in mind, I had only ever sailed on a 150-foot tall ship. I had never been on a, a small boat, nonetheless a 37-foot boat crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Much to my parents' dismay, I said yes. So I learned to sail, and to occupy my time, I documented our journey along the way. It was a natural learning environment. We caught our own dinner. This is how you did dishes at the end of the day. Red by moonlight, shower time. It was just a completely different way of living. On a hot day, we would stop the boat and go for a swim. And I just documented everything that was happening. And eventually, the story was published by Coastal Living magazine. So a few years into my career, I was in Italy, and I was working an editorial assignment for Yacht magazine. A friend of mine contacted me, and he was working the America's Cup World Series event in Venice, and said, hey, you should come check this out. I talked to Yacht Magazine and got credentials and decided to go check it out. I had never shot this event before, but I knew it was a big one and just thought I'd check it out. I remember sitting in the media center one day, I'd been there for a couple days, and I was talking to a well-known yacht photographer. And I remember him telling me, sizing me up and telling me, you'll never make it in this industry. I thought that was pretty bold. Um, I, and earlier that day, I, I had met, made a friend and met the guy who assigns uh, the boats for the media. And I, can, I ended up in all these prime spots. I didn't know how I ended up there. And one day, I was on the boat with all the team photographers, which at the time I didn't realize was a big deal. Now I understand. I knew who they were. They didn't know who I was. But I learned a lot. I had a shot in mind that I wanted to get. It was a little crazy, and I asked a few people if it was possible. What I wanted to do was shoot from in the water, swimming, and have the boat sail past me. Since I had conquered my fear of the ocean, I couldn't stay out of it. So I, asked, I, I ended up emailing all of the PROs. They're the people who are in charge of the media, and I asked if it's something that I could do with their teams. In person, the USA team said, absolutely not. That's too dangerous. But the French team entertained the idea, and they said, you know, competition starts tomorrow, but if, if you're going to be in Newport at the next event, come check in with us and we can make it happen. I wasn't planning to be there, but I said, okay, I'll be there. So I arrived in Newport and went to have a meeting with Loïc Peyron. This is one of the most famous French skippers. I didn't know who he was, but um, I went to go have a meeting with him. As I walked into the tent, it was like I was walking into a cafe in Europe. It smelled of cigarette smoke and coffee. And uh, I went in, I had the meeting, and I, I said, explained to Loïc what I wanted to do, and cigarette in hand stood there, said, no problem. We'll sail over you. We'll sail by you. No problem. Come back in an hour. Oh, shit. <laughs> I think when people say, you know, be careful what you wish for, that was what was crossing my mind. I luckily had all my stuff in my trunk, so I went and got all my gear, my wetsuit, and they, the team took me out in a small rib and dropped me in the water. The first couple passes, they passed to my right and sailed near me. The third, the third lineup, I could tell that I was lined up straight in the middle and that they were going over me. I remember the sound of my camera clicking, and I closed my eyes. It was so loud. It was crazy. Um, so much going on. I think the best way to picture it is try to picture you're riding a bike and trying to keep your, yourself in one spot, all while trying to hold your camera still, get the best frame, and not get hit by the dolphin striker that's just, well, in this photo, just to my right. Adrenaline was crazy. 
The team shared, ended up sharing a few of my images the next day on social media, and it blew up. It, it reached over 100,000 people in one day and earned me respect amongst, amongst my peers. I think it showed people that I was serious, willing to take risks, and maybe a little crazy. I remember overhearing a few guys in the media center talking about the girl with balls. A lot changed after that. There's a saying, if you want to change something, change something. Consider that in your work. You can't always get unique stories, but you can find unique ways to tell them. Life is going to throw you curveballs. Some may be so big and so debilitating that you may lose the desire to forge ahead. Rather than letting those moments take over you, consider making the decision to make it a part of your story, to own it as part of your story. It may help with the trauma. Is there something in your past you'd like to rewrite? There was for me. I called, on, I called upon the memory of this to earn my dream job in the Volvo Ocean Race. The application guidelines for the race were to submit five images and a short video sharing something about ourselves. They wanted to see our creativity, and they also wanted to get to know who we were. They wanted a window into who we were. My concept behind this idea was to kind of show what your memories look like when you close your eyes. They wanted to know that we could think outside the box. Throughout this process, I realized that the tough times, my hard times, were just, a part, just as much a part of my story as the good ones. And sometimes the difficult times are what drive you harder and further. I'd like to share this video with you. Every day I see you. I feel you. I can't take my eyes off of you. I am mesmerized by your beauty. I am humbled by your strength. It captivates me. I can't stop watching. In you, I see me. When I close my eyes, I see it. Seven years ago, you saved my life. I came to you broken. My body was beaten and my soul was shattered. I was far away from those who could comfort me and I felt so alone. You called to me, surrounding me, allowing me to feel your full embrace. You showed me yourself in many forms. Through your power and fury, I learned to be resilient. Through your energy and strength, I became stronger. Through your beauty, I learned to truly be present, to live in the moment and how quickly things can change. You made me laugh again. We had many days and nights together. You pushed me far outside my comfort zone. Through my fear, I learned to have trust and faith in you. Your ever-changing form taught me to not worry about things I can't control. In the darkness of the night, alone with my thoughts, you helped me transition from a dark place to one of wonderment and inspiration. You taught me that darkness is always present, but that rays of light are always filtering through. You gave me a choice. You can either gaze your perspective upward and use the darkness to illuminate the light shining down, or you can keep your gaze down and be lost in the turmoil of the dark waves crashing around you. I remember the day I made my choice because it defines how I see things today. You saved me and you always bring me home. Thank you. So I'd like to leave you guys with a few strategies for success. Fresh images and unique stories will come when you change your 
can come when you change your environment. Take a chance. Change something. Stay awake. Follow your ideas. Ask the crazy questions. Put yourself in situations that are ripe for content. Make your own tribe. Realize friendships when you make them and nurture the hell out of them. Because sometimes you might need to call them at 5 a.m. in the morning and have them assist you in chest deep water, freezing water, <laughs> and be smiling about it. Trust that everything you've been through, everything that you've experienced, contributes to the unique story of you. No one will see the way that you do. No one has walked your exact path. Let these differences inform who you are and what you create. Thank you. These two dimensions give the new mind great advantage.